Welcome everybody to the show, Bulletproof Troop. How's it going? Doing well, Blake Bulletproof Troop, known for dropping warheads on people's foreheads. And I got a whole bunch of stuff coming up this past week. I won a 25-man rumble. This coming weekend, I'm going to the NWA pay-per-view, followed up by some NWA power tapings. And the following weekend, I have a professional submission-only grappling match on pay-per-view. My man, life is good. And I'm out here rolling over the competition like an Abrams tank, baby. Locked, cocked, ready to rock. We're going to get into all of that. But first, I want to know a little bit about your uh, history in the sport of professional wrestling, the history of uh, catch wrestling. I see that you're into uh, catch as catch can and uh, taking on the submission wrestling and all that stuff. So why don't we start with the beginning? So uh, you want to hear about the fight side now or the professional wrestling first? Let's get into the uh, let's get into the pro wrestling start, and then we'll uh, go forward. So I actually made my sort of professional wrestling debut way back in 2019. It was not in the ring. I've been doing commentary for professional wrestling since 2019. Okay. Um, in that period of time, I've probably commentated 50 episodes of television and hundreds of matches of professional wrestling, including four NWA title changes. Before I ever even got in the ring, I was involved with four NWA title changes. I made my debut uh, October 2nd, 2021. So I've been in the ring now for about 15 months. I've had about 20 appearances in a variety of shows, including Championship Wrestling from Hollywood and the United Wrestling Network's Primetime Live Pay-Per-View Series. Um, Control Your Narrative, PCW Ultra, CCW, um, NWA. In about my 20 appearances, I have gone, I want to say, 17 and 1. I have one loss thus far in professional wrestling, which came to J.R. Kratos in my debut at the NWA, which aired on the Christmas special in the main event. So right now, I've been trucking through a lot of people. Like I said, 17 and 1 or so right now in professional wrestling. Since getting inside of the ring, and I've been involved in professional wrestling for a while before making the step inside of the ring. Um, let's, let's, uh, I just actually went back and watched that Kratos match before, uh, probably a couple days ago before, uh, you know, coming on here and it's quite enjoyable. I remember that very well, actually. So, um, how was it working with him? It was great. Um, so a big fan of mine is working with, or a big fan of, of, of work that I like to do is with other big dudes. I'm a six foot four, 240 pound heavyweight. And so if I'm in there with a guy who can't, physically stand up to it. I think that it tells a different story with Kratos, six foot something, about 300 pounds, trains MMA as well. And you saw we're both two big, bad dudes, and it was a hoss fight. It was a hoss fight. I enjoyed going at it with big, tough dudes who, who have some shoot background because that match looked very believable, very shooting. You know, it was two big bulls in there fighting, jockeying to win, win a scrap. And that's yeah. how I, I prefer a style of realism. To my wrestling. I, I understand that uh, very well. That's what I, I appreciate myself as well. Um, so how did you end up hooking up with the NWA? So my coach is Chris Silvio ESQ, who also manages Jack Stane and does a variety of other things on screen. Okay. Um, and so Chris told me he thought it was time for me to come up there. I was not, I was not uh, booked on the card that I ended up making my debut on. My coach told me to come and he thought that I was – I was ready, so I showed up with all my gear ready to work and ended up shaking hands with Billy, made a good impression with Billy, and I woke up day two of tapings to find out that they had a match for me against J.R. Kratos. Um, so I took a gamble on myself. I paid my own flight, I paid my own hotel, and I showed up to a show ready to help out and put in work, and it ended up paying off for me. Now, I know you have an MMA background and a catch wrestling background. And um, was professional wrestling something that you were, were always interested in? Yeah. So I was born in 87. So, like, do you know the Monday Night Wars was right. huge to me? The Attitude Era. That's like the wrestling I grew up on. And, like, I believed it when I was a kid. I did not want to believe it when um, people said that it wasn't on the level and, you know, kayfabe started to fall apart. And right around this time, late 90s or so, is when UFC started coming out and, mm -hmm. and gaining traction. It wasn't the mainstream sport it is now, but it was starting to make its way out there. And UFC stole a young Bulletproof Troops heart in like the late 90s and early 2000s. I started training jiu-jitsu in 2000. And so I would say the realism of combat sports like UFC really stole my heart. 
I ended up and eventually going and fighting professionally and so forth inside of a cage, but I always still had it in me. And I eventually created this professional wrestling type personality in Bulletproof Troop to, to increase the entertainment value of my brand and everything that I did in fighting. For example, Conor McGregor is Conor McGregor because of what he does outside the cage. Can Conor fight? Absolutely. I mean, you've got to be able to fight. Like, if you can't fight, it doesn't matter how well you can talk shit. But Conor was really good, really entertaining, good shit talker. And I saw that guys that were able to add entertainment value to their brand were getting, in my opinion, favorable matchups and, like, catapulted further in the rankings. Because UFC wants to push these guys. They want to make fun of this guy's hand. They want him to go out there and win so he can talk the shit. That's going to get the fans to either like them or hate them. So looking at guys like that, I created my brand of Bulletproof Troop, which was essentially a professional wrestling personality in combat sports. And it ended up getting some traction and some attention from professional wrestling. Um, even I got an email from the WWE. Even, um, it was back in like 2017. Okay. So I was doing things that, I, I mean, I was, like I said, a pro wrestling personality in combat sports. And then things that just slowly come full circle and eventually have brought me back to professional wrestling. And now professional wrestling is 100, I would say 100% of my focus because I still do some commentary and a little bit of competition. But it's absolutely the majority of my focus now in my career. Um, how did you hook up with the United Wrestling Network and Championship Wrestling from Hollywood? So that actually is, is much of the way that my fight career tied back into professional wrestling. Okay. Dave Marquez is, is really the big shot over at the United Wrestling Network. Yep. <laughs> and Dave does other things outside of professional wrestling in terms of production for events and so forth. And so some of his business partners, Steve Bass and George Basmajian, also have a fight promotion in Southern California. I'm from Los Angeles, where I'm born and raised. I live in Florida now. But so Dave's business partners brought me, had a sit down meeting with me. And this is when I'm just fighting, and I'm, but I'm, I have my whole gimmick starting to, like, you know, I'm a couple of years into my gimmick now where it's, like, starting to kind of come together. And they sit me down, and they were like, we want to bring you to our fight promotion. We want you to be a, a champion in our fight promotion. We want to push you on the wrestling side. We'll get you trained. We'll get you ready. And we'll try and kind of help blend the two because you being a crossover athlete. And I'm huge draw in Southern California. You being a crossover athlete, you know, we can kind of – you could be an asset to us on both both – fronts you know and so that was my kind of original in and how i began doing commentary for professional wrestling so the goal was to have me as an analyst you know expert combat sports analyst that way i'm able to put, get put over to the crowd as being an expert in combat and so forth without actually having to get inside of the ring to protect myself and so eventually covid happened and things got a little bit difficult with getting training and so forth and so I ended up moving out to Florida and training with Chris Silvio. But so that the way I got brought to the United Wrestling Network with Dave Marquez was through the fight side, his business partners that also do fighting because they saw a potential in me to be a marketable asset to them on both fronts. Hey, this is the one-man gold mine, the one-man enterprise of professional wrestling and all entertainment, Flynn Hendricks. And you better believe when I'm looking for a good podcast to listen to, I go to my own. I go to the I Know You Hear Me podcast hosted by me, Flynn Hendricks. That is such a fresh perspective for how you should look at life, too. Like, I just, I love that. And then when I'm feeling spooky, I go to my other podcast, Tales from the Haunt, where myself, yeah. I want my head shoved inside a 15-pound silicone mask more. You know, <laughs> I want to have a bucket of sweat coming off me at the end of the night. And just Jeff. Dogs don't lay eggs, <laughs> <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> Talk to other scare actors about what it takes to get into the world of scare acting. So if you're curious about how people became professional wrestlers, actors, prioritized their mental health, became entrepreneurs, avoided burnout, or got into scare acting, you need to go check out I Know You Hear Me and Tales from the Haunt, available on all podcasting platforms. And I know you hear me. Um, in your catch wrestling career, shoot wrestling career, uh, whatever, however you want to word it. Uh, I know there was a lot of professional wrestlers that were, have a catch wrestling or had a catch wrestling, uh, background in the somewhat older days, guys like Billy Robinson and Carl Gotch and Tony yeah. Inoki and stuff. And then they crossed over. Um, how did you get into that style of wrestling and, and, you know, so, um, I've been training in grappling arts for 
man, for like 22 years now. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I'm a, currently a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is right below black belt. I got my brown belt from Kenny Johnson, who was, who's in, I don't know if you know who Dan Gabe was. He's of in the course. Dan Gabe yeah. Hall of Fame. Uh, and so I'm going to get my black belt from a guy named Hegan Machado and Kenny Johnson. They're going to give it to me joint. Hegan Machado's, they're cousins of the Gracies. And so very early jiu-jitsu, I got, and all my lineage is through uh, the Machado family. But the big thing about the Machado family is they started to implement American-style wrestling to the submission grappling, where the Gracies call it pure jiu-jitsu. It's a lot more on the bottom, on your back, bigger a guy on top of you. Where once competition started coming out with jiu-jitsu, it wasn't as much just defensive or self-defense, where now it's two guys who actually train grappling. Being able to retain top position or get on top of guys is extremely important. So the Machados implemented a lot more of this American style wrestling to their grappling. And this is the style of grappling that, I, that I'm that i in. And so I basically had a very catch wrestling-esque style of grappling going into things. And then I've competed a bunch of times. These are all shoot medals. And there's probably like 30 something up here. All gold. There's wow. three, three silvers up here, which are kind of hidden. You can't really tell. And so I won this bad boy right here. This is the um, Billy Robinson classic catch wrestling absolute champion. So, of everybody there, I smashed. Anybody who wanted to compete in the absolute division smashed everybody. Um, I got more snake picks. Snake pit right here, too. Um, but so I've been competing, as you can tell, for, man, a really long time. Like, even, I don't know how well you can see this. This is an arm right here. I always tell people to rip their arm off and put it on the trophy wall. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> So you've, um, you know, you mentioned the Billy Robinson uh, trophy, etc. Um, I know that, uh, are you familiar with uh, scientific wrestling with Jake Shannon? Jake yeah, Shannon, absolutely. I actually am going to text Jake in about an hour. Yep. Yeah, um, he and Billy were very close, and he wrote a book on Billy a number of years ago, which I, I own, and it's uh, a tremendous book. Have you ever gotten a chance to read this or look I at it? Not. So I, I listen to a lot of audio books and stuff, and so... Yep. I- always looking for things that I got to add to my list, but that's actually a really good book to add to the list because I am a huge fan of history and sports and like sports histories that I'm involved with. Like right here, I got, I got one of my, my one of my books too sweet. I have that. Yes. Yeah. Well, like I love to read if it's, if it's history and in like the business that I'm in or a sport yep. that I'm in, or I mean, I even like military history. I, don't know, I enjoy history. Yeah. I put that on the list. I appreciate that. Yeah, you should really even talk to, you know, when you uh, talk to him later, mention that book, tell him that somebody recommended it, because it was a very, very, very good book. I uh, I was a huge Billy Robinson fan growing up, because, um, like you said, watching professional wrestling, there was something like a, there was a sense of realism with what he was doing in the sport, you know what I mean? And the realism is, in my opinion, we all want to believe him, like, give me something that I can watch and be like, wow, that was... That was a scrap, even though, like, you know, it's pro wrestling, but still, like, I don't think we need to insult the audience's attention. With exactly. Them, you yeah. know, and, like, our intelligence with it. You know, it's, I mean, with each their own, there's different different strokes for different folks. There's certain foods I like better than others. I can't tell people it's right or wrong. I can just do what I enjoy doing for me, you know. There's people out there that like the entertainment aspect or the goofiness, the the comedic. Uh, you know, wrestling can be a, a variety show. I always liked a traditional style that uh, presented a uh, competitive realism uh, when watching professional wrestling. I agree 100. percent That's totally my flavor. Stuff like Josh Barnett's Bloodsport. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you happen to watch uh, GCW Bloodsport? Josh Barnett versus John Moxley. Uh, yeah, I watched that. Yeah. I yep. commented that whole part. Oh, really? That's that's awesome. That's, yeah. yeah, I look forward to that show every year now. So you know, I'm trying to get on the I'm trying to get on the April one. It's in LA. I'm like, Josh, I'm a big ticket seller. Let me <laughs> get on the card. I'll look for you. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, like you said, you've been competing for Snake Pit USA as well. This is uh, um, how's that going? Like, and you just had a, a match some or last year you wrestled for the heavyweight title. Yes, yeah, so that was actually back in 2021. So when I won this Billy Robinson uh, Classic in the Absolute Division, I won the wild card spot on a four-man tournament with the Snake Pit Catch Wrestling Heavyweight World Title, which was vacant at the time. I ended up going and competing. This was March of 2021 that I competed um, for the title. I went all the way to the finals, and I was pinned by the current world champion, Travis Reef, in the finals. 
Um, he became crown world champion immediately after beating me and still holds the title to this day. And that is a loss I am hoping to get back at some point in my career. Um, we'll see if that happens or not, but that's a belt I really wanted. Well, uh, there's another question I have, a couple more. Uh, let, tell me about this high rollers Brazilian, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You got yes, cornered so by RVD. Today, and that's what I'm competing for on the 18th, Saturday, February okay. 18th, is a submission-only grappling league in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, I competed their first show. I competed their third show. I competed at their 14th show. And then I hosted their... 20th and 21st shows, and then I commentated some of the 20th. Um, and so, actually, you have a funny story with High Rollers 21. I went and my, I didn't have an opponent. I was supposed to have an opponent. Things fell off. We get the fight there. I had my travel and stuff all covered, so I went out anyway and thought they'd find me an opponent, but they couldn't. But that, so it ended up working out, though, because the guys who typically host the event couldn't make it. So they're like, Troop, you, you don't just host the event. Which was cool. So I end up hosting the event. I'm just in my fight shorts, my, my, my gimmick armor and stuff. And then it comes main event time and they come out and they're like, hey, so you're going to introduce so and so. And then we're going to say that the champ didn't show up. We're stripping him of the belt. We're giving this guy the belt. Like, thanks for coming, no main event. And so I'm in my fight shorts and I'm just like, I got my fight shorts on. Let me, let me just jump in the main event now. So I end up going to the main event against um, the guy. Who, so we, we had an exhibition match, not for the belt. When he gets the guy in the main event, I end up. I ended up losing, but hosted the whole event for three hours and just <laughs> took off my shirt and jumped into the main event. Wow. Tracy Smothers, Harley Race, Tim Storm, Bushwhacker Luke, Bobby Fool. The Pro, Pro Wrestling, Wrestling Vault, Vault Volume, Volume 1. 1. Bill Dundee, Super Mix Hernandez, C.W. Anderson, Ricky Morton, Sir Mo, and many others share their stories of determination, triumph, and, and sorrow. sorrow. Get your book today at Russellville.com or at Amazon.com. Russellville, it's a wrestling day. Yeah, and so as a purple belt earlier in 2022, uh, April of 2022, I competed against the black belt. I smashed him. I ended up getting promoted to brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu after that, which is right below black belt. I've been doing Jiu-Jitsu for like 20 years, and I've never cared what color my belt is. So, like, I'm only getting – I'm only asked. so I called my coach. I was like, coach, I'm ready to, like, get my black belt. My coach like, dude, you've been ready for your black belt for like five years. I'll give it to you the next time I see you. And I'm like, coach, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta get my brown belt first. I can't go from purple to black. And then you gotta wait a year. So I know I'm gonna get it in June or July. Yeah, July. Um, because all a belt does if you're real is hold your pants up or hold your gi clothes. <laughs> the only colored belts that matter are gold. Okay, yeah, you got a point there. Uh, tell me what it was like with RVD in your corner. Um, it's awesome coming out of the RVD. So he's, we've been friends actually since long before I got into professional wrestling. I was just doing fight stuff. Uh, yeah. And so it's, it's cool having RVD in my corner. Um, you know, he hypes me up before we come out. It's good publicity for me. Uh, it's dope. I mean, and I grew up like, that's like, this is like the era of wrestling that I kind of grew up watching, you know? So like, it's, Sometimes it can be a little surreal having people like that I played as in video game characters of growing up. Right. And now, like, my personal friend walked me out of the cage, like, it's your time, my man, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's, it can be a little surreal sometimes. It's, it's, it's cool and rewarding, you know, like, it, yep. like, you know, I'm doing a lot of the right things moving forward and or with, with my career and so forth that I have. WWE Hall of Famers that believe in me and stand behind me, literally. You know what I mean? So I know you're working the end of... Oh, wait. Hang on. Before we get into that, uh, tell me about what it was like with uh, Control Your Narrative and stuff like that. That's a, um, a group so my, that was very... Yeah, go ahead. With Control Your Narrative, I had an excellent time there. There were a lot of great yeah. guys in the locker room there. Um, I know that they got a lot of heat about stuff that you know, alleged like racism and stuff, which I saw zero of while we were there. A lot really? of like, extremely diverse, whether you're talking about like genders or races or everything seems super welcoming and brotherhood. And, and um, I don't have anything bad to say about like CYN or any of that type of stuff, which really surprised me the negative press they got online. I didn't understand it. Um, 
locker room is great in being able to work on cards or get feedback from guys like Adam Sher, Braun Strowman, EC3, Austin Aries, uh, you know, where there's just a ton of knowledge in the room of being able to hear things or have, I didn't really have matches there per se, um, but getting feedback on a variety of things. So with control your narrative, I was a character that they called death and I would just basically come out and slaughter everybody. And I just would literally come out and clear the ring of like five people and just, I never, never, I never took a single bump at control your narrative. Or maybe like five or six appearances coming out and just slaughter people. And then, and then I'd leave. It was, it was a pretty cool little, little gig. I got myself in some political trouble there though. So I no longer work for control your narrative, but that may change in the near future. You want to hear mind, a funny story about politics? <laughs> sure. Do you mind uh, embellishing that or getting into no, that? I'll tell you all about it. Uh, all right. So it's June 11th and Control Your Narrative has a show at Tin Roof Orlando. And like I said, uh, I'm being referred to as death on the show and I come out and just slaughter everybody. So here comes the part where Troop comes out and saves the day. There's like good guys and bad guys in what's called the Project Pit. It's like kind of a big match, usually a group match. And then I come out and I beat up whoever wins the match. Uh, so like four bad guys are winning. And then there's one guy named Kate and Prince Prince uh, KK, who or Prince KK, who's who's a gay guy. And so he's like on the good guy team. Bad guys beat everyone else up. And they're like beating him up at the end. My music hits. I come out. I smash all the bad guys, toss all the bad dudes out, save the day. It's first day of Pride Month and stuff. Come out, save the day. And so like the crowd here sees me as just this monster who's come out and fucking smash everybody which is, is what it's been at every show. And I'm just bringing that up so you see what the people in the room have thought about me, the way that I'm being pushed. Now comes the after party in the same venue. It's not like the same room, but it's in like the same venue. Right. And so we have like a big VIP area. And in our VIP area, there's like fucking a bigger table in there, you know? And so I'm with one of my girlfriends. I got a bunch of girlfriends uh, and they know about each other and all that. Um, they hang out sometimes and stuff. It's pretty cool. But so anyway... I'm with one of my girls, and she's into girls, and so we're like out on the dance floor, dancing with girls, and I'm having a blast. I'm having a great night. I had a great booking. I'm out with a cool chick who's like, I'm, I'm having like maybe the most fun in the bar, you know, like not being obnoxious. I'm just really enjoying my night. And so I come back over and into our VIP section, and I'm like standing where the table is. And so there's like, like I said, a big booth behind me. And so I'm standing there, my chick's next to me, and we're looking now out at the dance floor tables behind us. And I get like pushed, like, like not hard enough to make me fall, but hard enough I'd like take a few steps. And I know the VIP, the, the like VIP, VIP tables right behind me. So like, you know, I stop and I, I look back and I turn around. And then I'm like, maybe it was Adam, maybe it was one of my buddies, like maybe it was some one that I'm not gonna like get super mad. Like, but they pushed, they pushed me really hard. Like, it seemed like a really aggressive push. So I turn around and there's this probably like 50 year old dude sitting there on the very end of the booth. Look at me dead in my eyes, laughing hysterically. Some dude, I have no idea who this guy is. So I like lean in, I get nice and close. I'm like, my man, I'd appreciate it if you didn't touch me. Big smile on my face, super nice. And he's just fucking got this big shit eating grin on his face. I'm like, my man, I'd appreciate it if you didn't touch me, blah, 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 blah. And this dude just erupts in laughter. We're like this, I'm kind of pissed. So like, we're like close. He erupts in laughter in my face. And I'm, so I'm like, nah, my man, like, for real, don't touch me again. We're going to have a fucking problem. And so right then, Adam Sheriff, Ron Strowman, his chick taps me. And she's like, hey, it's cool. He's with us, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, oh, well, I'm just talking to him right now. And I look back, and he's like smiling to me again. I lean in. I'm like, my man, I need to know that you and I have an understanding that you're not going to touch me again. And it's the first thing he says to me. He's like, oh, yeah, mate. Why don't you go fuck yourself? I smack i smacked the fuck out of this dude i ended up knocking him out and um i had no idea who the guy was but so adam jumps up and fucking starts screaming when he gets fucked out blah 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 but i didn't so i just don't even argue i just fucking turn around and walk away um and then i find out a short period of time later that apparently that guy was do you know who danny birch is martin stone yeah the uh he was just in nxt for like a year or so ago right yeah. The same guy? Yeah. Turns out it's Danny Burch, former NXT Tag Team Champion. Yep. I mean, he's wrestled everywhere, but yeah, that's yeah. where the last place. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, so they let me go for that. They let me go for standing up to a fucking bully. Wow. I slapped the fuck out of that guy. I knocked his ass out. 
sleeping with an open hand slap. Blow! I'm gonna fuck myself. I kind of did fuck myself, but. <laughs> That's a very interesting story there. Wow. Who'd have thunk? Really? I mean, hey, Lapsack, troop is death. That's the, yeah. that's the impression he has there. <laughs> wow. So um, let's see. You took place in the CCW Rumble, like you said. How did that go? I just, CCW, I haven't taken a bump yet. I think I've had like three or four appearances. I just come out and I slaughter things, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> That's a great company. They've got. Uh, they were. They did have a, we, a YouTube series for a little while. That was very. Uh, you know, they got a lot of great talent there. They do, and it's very well put together. Great events, super hot crowd. They like storylines, mm -hmm. building up the pay per view type payoffs. Like they get it. Yeah. CCW is doing it right. Yeah, uh, of course. Let's see. This weekend you're in uh, uh, NWA. Enough yep. said. You're going to be taking part in the pay per view. I will be tag teaming with Jack Stain, accompanied by my coach, Chris Silvio, and I'm not sure who we're against or what the plan is. I just, all I know is in ring tag team action. Okay. And then, of course, like you said, two days of NWA power tapings, power in USA, I think. They do them back to back, I think. Correct. Still. Yep. So, what else you got coming up if you want to promote it here? Right now is the time. You know, those are all of the big ones after the submission only grappling. Um, I know in March sometime I have a, I also work as a combat sports analyst in a lot of different combat sports um, settings. One of those is Lights Out Extreme Fighting on the Fubo Sports Network. I just did my last broadcast with them on January 14th. We had hundreds of thousands of viewers on a live broadcast. So being trusted with a live microphone is a big deal. And I got another one of those coming up in March. And I'm told we're doing 10 this year. So I'm excited about that. I did my fourth one this past January. And I am a big fan of doing as much analyst work as possible. It's much easier talking about fighting people than actually fighting people, my man. That shit is a tough gig, I'll tell you what. <laughs> it's less painful, too, as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes my jaw is a little tired after commentary, but it never hurts. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Why don't you pay, uh, point everybody towards your social media? Yeah, so we have everybody to go on over to at Bulletproof Troop on Instagram, at Big Troop 22 on Twitter, or Facebook.com forward slash Bulletproof Trooper, or you can go to BlakeTroop.com or BulletproofTroop.com. Come pick yourself up some swag. I got all kinds of stuff for my Bulletproof Troopers and Bulletproof Troopettes, baby. Locked, cocked, and ready to rock. I want to thank you for joining me today. And we'll have to have you back soon. Maybe after the NWA tapings, you can come back. You tell me, my man. I'm always ready. Like I said, locked, cocked, and ready to rock. Thank you very much.